back to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we come to you on a week-to-week -week basis from Washington, D.C. and the United States as we look around the globe in 144 different nations looking for those thousand best practices, technology, services, and products that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And of course, we're looking for the leaders that are making a difference as we look around the globe in various countries. One of those countries that we're really taking a focus upon is India, a nation that may be going to be the largest population on the planet, 1.4 billion before 2020, and also may be ending up in the top three, possibly, or top five for sure, as far as the largest economies. A very dynamic, very diverse country, uh, high energy, high color, high sound, high everything, as uh, my guest sitting right beside me knows, who's from there. But we have someone that's joining us that has a very special organization that's looking at uh, rural development, rural agriculture, specifically in organics, which is something that actually the farmers are looking at as they want more value added as far as the products they're bringing into the Indian marketplace. This is Zarefathi uh, Raimoto, who is uh, the uh, founder of what's called Inspire, a fantastic name, Indigenous Natural and Sustainable Practices for Reviving Earth. She's coming in by Skype. Uh, Raifathi, thank you for being with us. And sitting right beside us is a, uh, a uh, continuing friend, I want to call him old, he's quite young actually. Uh, but this is uh, Sadir Sukra. He is the Outreach Specialist for Biodiversity for a Livable Climate. And thank you for being back with us. Thanks for having me, sir. Glad to have you. Uh, Rafathi, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Oh, thank you for this wonderful opportunity. Green greetings to all of you. Uh, all glad to have viewers. you. Uh, do us a favor, if you will. Uh, how did you come up with this name, Inspire? I do love it. It's fantastic. And, uh, okay. and then a little bit about the mission and the vision as far as Inspire itself. Yeah, Inspire is very much engaging itself in supporting the environmental restoration and uh, sustainable farming, ecological activities, and how to make uh, your farming system into an agro-ecosystem. These are our main focus activities, and uh, we are working with a large number of farmers. And one of our special focus is restoring the farmlands who are affected by the tsunami and other disasters due to the impact of global warming. Tell us a little bit, of, how did you come up with this name? This is a very uh, ingenious name. I really like it. So can you share a little bit about the name, uh, how you came up yeah. with this, and particularly the okay. indigenous part of that because you know we work with indigenous peoples and countries all across the globe and so uh, this is the first time we've had this mentioned in relationship to India. Wonderful. So basically uh, our organization when it is registered in 2005 we have a very big long name it is not Inspire but uh, after traveling to several countries because of our tsunami uh, rehabilitation process in the saline lands many countries and nations invited us even uh, your former president Bill Clinton visited us and he took us to different countries as he was the UN ambassador for tsunami rehabilitation process at that time so our story inspired many people then they started calling me as inspire Revati. so finally we decided to change our name as inspire and uh, with a uh, yeah long uh, explanation about indigenous natural our beliefs yeah uh, I tell you it's, it's a fantastic name so don't change it you know it's, it's wonderful uh, tell us <laughs> why you. do you Thank think you, organic uh, farming is really a way forward as far as farmers in India specifically and what is the demand that's coming from the marketplace that's really seeking uh, organic foods? Yeah, market is very much promising. It is uh, growing day by day. Like the global market, Indian markets, Indian consumers also become more and more aware of the hazardous chemicals present, uh, toxins present in, say, in their food. So it has a very big scope. But beyond the consumers, uh, our farmers and our farmlands, they are very, very fatic along usage of chemicals, excessive usage of fertilizers, made the lands very much saline, and productivity is very much uh, under 
the estimations. So a lot of farmers, they are highly indebted. And every one of our five farmers are committing suicide. These are the stories of our farmlands. So it becomes a battlefield now. So to save our farmers, a lot of movements like us, we are working every minute and second. A lot of research is ongoing with a, part, with a participatory approach. So farmers are engaged in this participatory research and a lot of indigenous seeds and knowledge restored. Because global warming, we are talking about the impact of global warming in huge forums, but the result is with the farmers and fishermen who are at the end of the uh, communities. So really, we are very much suffering now because seasonal rainfall pattern completely collapsed, only cyclonic rainfall. You couldn't predict anything under no calendar of activities. Under this rest of situations, the cost of cultivation, if it is increases, agriculture becomes a gamble. So we teach more and more farmers how to sustain their agriculture and how to minimize the impact of global warming and our disaster preparedness designs. These are our ways of educating our people and making their farming more and more ecological. Uh, well, it seems like we're uh, staying with you very well on Skype. Sadir, you want to ask the next question? Hi, Ravati. Uh, so what are some specific methods you use to train farmers to move towards organic farming? And how have they responded? What, what, what's been your experience working with farmers? Yeah, they are very much inquisitive to, know, to learn and also experience practice, this type of practices. Because for the past two generations, we were very much moved out of our traditional knowledge. Even though India has a rich knowledge, 10,000 years of heritage in agriculture, recently, uh, in the last uh, 50 years, most of our farmers, they forget our traditional practices because uh, they were disconnected from them. So soil fertility is the very, very important thing. We have to focus very much. Our results are very much down now. So organic farming techniques, when it is introduced, the farmers are really getting a new energy, new enthusiasm. And farmlands, very quickly, we do remineralization of soils, and the soils are depleted with so many minerals. We practice, uh, um, we adopt several techniques called uh, multiple seed sowing method and uh, on the spot composting and a lot of bio solutions which are like your composting. So many of these practices combine together and uh, make the farmlands uh, quickly into once again very much productive and promising and how to retrieve the connections and relationships, how to strengthen the ecosystem. Uh, more and more animal tree crop integration and uh, how to maximize the farm economics. These are our focus areas. So farmers, when they get introduced to these techniques, and most of the farmers are very much worried about the pest attacks. When they teach them, the pests are not, all the insects are not the pest, but you have two types of insects, beneficial and harmful insects. It is difficult for them to understand the situation. So in their language, we explain them there are two types of insects. One are vegetarians who are the best eating their crop, but they are well protected by the other insects. They are the non-vegetarians. If you count the, number, the ratio, it is rarely one is to 32. So you are very much protected. If you walk towards organic farming, then uh, it, you will be under the protection of army, navy, air force, because spiders are your army and the, of course the dragonflies, your air force. So they are the helicopters searching everywhere. If any ins insect is there, new entry is there without passport and visa, immediately they will be evacuated. Like this in their language, we teach them the basic techniques of sustainable farming. And uh, every time we teach them how the cover crops are very, very important, mulching and uh, the legume plants, how they are saving the dry situation when the prolonged drought is there, the cover crop, how it is cutting down the water usage, minimum water usage, uh, how you can travel forward and dew harvesting during the night time. So to teach the mulching and other techniques, so we teach them being a woman, mother nature, she always wants to be dressed properly, gently, she don't want to be naked. So cover her with uh, any of the green crops or dry mulching like that. 
So all these uh, methods are very, very simple, feasible and easily replicable. And using the neighborhood resources of our farming places, being uh, a small and a marginal farmer, resource poor farmer, our farmers, uh, they have to adapt to the techniques which are very, very simple and cost effective. So our uh, looking methods at, are uh, derived right from for, our right yeah. Right for the, uh, looking at your connecting the consumers and the urban areas with the farmers. Tell us a little bit about that process and we're going to quickly run out of time so uh, we have a couple more questions so we need to be quick on the answer. So how are you connecting the consumers and what's the importance of the farmers and the consumers getting to know each other? Yeah, it is very, very important. When I start this journey in the initial days, I came to know that uh, there is a big split between the communities, consumers, so they don't care about the farmers. They don't know anything about farming practices. And the farmers are very much suffering because the market is often fluctuating and also no support from the consumers and the consumers' expectation. And uh, they expect many things beyond their imagination and also the stress situations are not permitting the farmers to produce the food all the time, off-season food. But when they came to know the consumers, when we uh, educate the consumers, when we arrange for the producer-consumer meetings and uh, joint forums, both the, both of the communities, they have several interactions and uh, each other get understanding other problems, other issues of the other side. So now, a lot of movements emerging, consumer producer associations are uh, strong enough. Like your CSA program, there also we have so many programs. Now the local communities are very much supporting organic practices. And market is very much potential, very much promising. Day by day it is growing. I tell you, that's absolutely fantastic. So it's a really great energy as far as the consumers and also the farmers themselves. Is that correct? Yeah, it is true. The synergy is very much uh, going on and a lot of people, they came to know that uh, most of the diseases and uh, other things are because of the way of farmers uh, farming. So they really want to show their solitude and uh, actually support to the farmers. So a lot of efforts now. Everywhere we go, the consumers and the producers, both of them joining together and we have big melas, food festivals, millet festivals like that. So many occasions are there. To uh, Ray Fadi, I got more, one last more more question. We're running out of time, uh, almost out of time. Uh, what do you see for the growth of your organization over the next 5, 10, and 15 years? And you have 10 seconds. Okay, we so Quick. far we reached 1.1 million plus farmers in India and we want to progress more with the objective of more and more lead farmers train us. Of course, making India a very, very sustainable. And thank you very much for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Sabe usted que su voto cuenta? ¿Cómo votar en ausencia? Día de las elecciones es el 8 de noviembre y su voto cuenta. Su voz es su voto. ¿Va a estar lejos del condado de Fairfax en el día de la elección? Es muy fácil votar si no estás en Fairfax. ¿Usted trabaja o comutar más de 11 horas por día? ¿Es usted un cuidador principal de una persona enferma en casa? Estas son algunas de las razones por las que un votante registrado para votar en ausencia. Los votos por correo deben ser recibidos por la oficina de elecciones de a las 7 p.m. el 8 de noviembre. La votación en persona ausente ya está disponible para lunes a sábado en las ubicaciones del condado de Fairfax, en el centro de gobierno, y los satélites hasta el 5 de noviembre. Para horas y lugares, visita el sitio web de la Liga de Mujeres Votantes. El éxito de nuestra democracia depende de la participación y tu votación de todos los ciudadanos. Usted puede ser la fuerza que provoca el cambio, el progreso en nuestro país.
que cuenta con su opinión. Su futuro depende de su voto. Votación es realmente importante. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet as we look around the globe for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products, and of course the leaders that are putting them into implementation and also creating the innovation that's needed as we go to a planet of nine billion people. Yes, nine billion people by 2050 and possibly 12 to 13 billion by the end of the century. So how are we gonna provide the basic infrastructure and everything that people need so that they actually have an increased, increased quality of life? And that's what we're all about. And we have uh, two gentlemen, one who's coming in by Skype and the other is sitting right beside me here. This is uh, Sadir Shukra, who is the uh, outreach specialist for a group called Biodiversity for a Livable uh, Climate, the DC chapter. And then we have uh, Sukra uh, Nemeth, Mukherjee, who is the development coordinator for what's called the Association for India's Development. It goes by AID. You see the logo right behind us. And uh, Sunath, are you here? Okay, he's going to be coming in. Looking at uh, this particular organization, uh, the Association for India's Development, why is this so important, Sukhir? Uh, well, they're, they're working on a lot of interesting projects. Uh, so we just had Ravithi on. She's, uh, she, she's you know, Who is working that? on organic agriculture in India. Uh, okay. She's worked with over a mil million farmers Fantastic. and also um, working on... Well, what's her name? Uh, uh, Ravithi. Okay. Uh, so she uh, 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 has also been extremely successful in, in reclaiming agricultural lands that are been destroyed by uh, natural disasters like cyclones and tsunamis. And also, too, I understand that because of all the, uh, the increased chemical use, fertilizers, insecticides, pesticides, that many of the uh, tillable acres are now out of production and no longer are being productive. Is that correct? Yeah, so she's found that, uh, that the use of, of chemicals has, has um, added to uh, salinity in the soil, uh, which is also an, an, a problem with... with uh, uh, cyclones and to tsunamis affecting land. So yeah, and, and also too, it's the uh, increase in uh, drawdown of water from the aquifers too. So you're getting uh, selenium, mm -hmm. uh, selenium uh, in the water. But uh, looking at this association for India's development, why is it so important? Well, we're, we're, AID is working on many projects uh, in India. So part, some of them are organic agriculture, but. Uh, Basically, sustainable development in both from the environmental perspective as well as from, from the social perspective and okay. from a uh, justice perspective. Fantastic. Uh, Sinaf, how are you? Are you coming through? Uh, yes. Can you hear me? Yeah. Sinaf, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. How are you? Very good, thank you. Uh, we're glad to have you. Say, tell us a little bit about your organization, uh, Sudair, who is a friend of yours and a colleague is sitting beside me, and he was telling us a little bit, but talk about the Association for India's Development, AID. Okay, so uh, Association for Devel India's Development, or AID as you call it, is a volunteer movement which works with grassroots groups in India on to that side, marginalized cities of India. So we work with about 100 of, uh, you know, partners across India on various issues of health, agriculture, education, women's rights, environmental justice, and social justice in general. So we do that by supporting uh, the projects that uh, you know that are there going on in various parts of India, and also by getting uh, involved in the issues. Many of our volunteers go there. Uh, some spend large amounts of time. Some spend short amount of time, and come back and educate 
the volunteer community here, which helps us in learning and live a more responsible life. So as an organization, our goal is to promote just, sustainable and equitable development in India, uh, a development process that is people-centric, that directly um, benefits the people, and we do so by part grassroots group in India who are working very close to the community. I tell you, I think that's absolutely fantastic. So why did you decide personally that you wanted to become involved on a full-time basis in an organization like uh, AID? Yeah, that was a very um, interesting life transition uh, from working as an electrical engineer. I got involved AID as a volunteer. Um, and uh, the more I got involved, the more my perspective changed about the priorities of my life, the priorities of society, and more importantly, what, uh, you know, a, a large part of the hidden marginalization that was there, um, which I wasn't aware of till I working with these groups in India, uh, till I started visiting remote villages in India, understanding the issues, and how those issues are connected also to a large extent on of to a large extent of irresponsible living by also another section of of the population. So these just uh, change my perspectives deeply, and and the more I connected with the people, with the communities, with the group, uh, you know, it was a liberating process. Um, and then a point came where it did not make sense for me at all to continue the work I was doing. There was no enjoyment, there was no uh, fulfillment, and there was no liberation. And this, this is not a moral stance. I'm not taking a moral stance. I'm just saying that's how it worked for me. Uh, whereas on the other hand, this uh, work with AID uh, with our partners, with connecting directly to the people, to the marginalized people and the struggles for justice. That gave me immense amount of uh, and learning and, like I said, a liberating process. And in 2007, I stopped working after having volunteered for five years. And um, then about for three, four years, I just, uh, you know, did this work on my own uh, full time and then Slowly, it decided to, uh, you know, have good work full time in the U.S. Also, because in the U.S. itself, it is, has become a large organization with about 36 chapters and 800 volunteers, and a lot to coordinate amongst them. So that is how it kind of, you know, things fell into place. And I started working around end of 2011. I started working full time. Well, I tell you, the uh, photographs that you provided for us are absolutely fantastic, and it really shows you what you see when you go into India. I've been uh, and traveled around most of India three times now over the uh, last uh, three decades and spent a lot of time out in the rural villages. And so the whole thing is, is that we just need to uh, keep focused as we're doing it. So uh, anyway, Sadir, looks like we're okay as far as Skype is concerned. Mm -hmm. Hi, uh, Somnath. Uh, so can you uh, briefly explain uh, the meaning of the word Sundarbans and, and what's been your experience working with farmers in the Sundarbans area? Yes, so uh, Sundarbans, as you know, is the largest chunk of mangrove forests in the world. This is a delta region where two very big rivers of India, Ganga and Brahmaputra, drain into the Bay of Bengal. And it's a huge estuary with um, you know hundreds of uh, islands, um, uh, huge wildlife, and also a very dense population living in that area. So Sundarbans actually comes from the word uh, Sundari tree. There is a tree which is which grows uh, very well in that region, and it's called Sundari. Uh, and ban means forest, Bali. and it's it, you know as you know Sundarban is part of. Uh, West Bengal and Bangladesh. Uh, so the language is Bengali. So it is derived from that tree, Sundari. So a tree, a, a forest comprised of Sundari trees is Sundarbans. And in, in, in lighter terms, it also translates to be a full forest. 
Now looking at the uh, Suderbunds and the farmers are there, uh, what kind of challenges do they have as far as the going to organic farming and what types of education do you go through through AID in order to allow them to transition into organic farming, which uh, India, like most countries, actually has a higher value added than just in the commercial uh, large-scale bulk crops. Right. So, I mean, uh, challenges are plenty, uh, primarily uh, because we are talking about very marginal farmers. We are talking about subsistence farmers. We are talking about landless families. Uh, we are talking of an average land holding of one third acre on which families subsist. My goodness, did you say one third of an acre? Yes, oh, one that's third incredible. of an acre hmm. is the average land holding. So you can well imagine any little change is magnified in the lives of these communities in a very large way. So it has to be done extremely sensitively. Um, and and the, the challenge we faced in their transitioning was the fear that it would yield less than what it is doing with uh, a chemical. Because this is a generation of farmers in India uh, have uh, been cultivating on chemical agriculture. They, they haven't seen a whole lot of organic agriculture, and it has been drilled into everyone's mind that it is only through chemical agriculture you will get the, uh, you know, you will be able to increase your yield, and that translates directly to more money in your family. And when you are a subsistence farmer, when you are a farmer, uh, you know it is very difficult to take a gamble on your only source of uh, livelihood. So that was a huge challenge uh, that we had faced. At, uh, in, the, the, in fact, that was the single most first, uh, you know, largest challenge we faced, that what if my yield goes down? So, but we had taken a very good approach of, uh, you know, just try it out on a small portion of your land and see if it uh, goes down or sustains or whatever the results are. And then we can go slowly. So I would say that was the, one of the biggest uh, challenge. The, oh, another big challenge. Uh, Sonath, we are absolutely running out of time. Very interesting topic, uh, but I want to ask you, and we have about 10 seconds to do that, what do you see for the growth of aid and its work in these areas, Sudabans, over the next 5, 10, and 15 years? Yes, I mean, we definitely uh, see, and we are already seeing, the government is coming forward to support this. We have gone from 25 farmers in 2009 to 20,000 farmers in 2016. We are setting up outlets where they can directly sell their produce at a fair price. And the government is approaching us to be able to work with so many farmers. It wants Thank to you for being with us as we create the Emerald Planet. Hi, I am Peggy Knight, and I'm with the League of Women Voters of the Fairfax area. And I'm here to share information about Election Day with the viewing audience of the Fairfax Public Access Television area. Election Day is Tuesday, November 8th. Do you know that you can vote for more than just the president and the vice president? Every representative in Congress is up for election this year. But that's not all you can vote for on Election Day. There are two proposed constitutional amendments for Virginia. There is a meal tax referendum. And there are three separate bonds to vote on. For more information about these issues and the candidates, go to vote411.org. Remember, Election Day is November 8th. And your vote is your voice. And every vote counts. books at the library. Hello. You have a lot of great books.
books here today. You know there's more than just books at the library. I know. There's more than just books at the library. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. you from Washington, D.C., and we're looking around the globe in major uh, large countries as well as small countries. Uh, looking for those thousand best practices, technology, services, products, and of course the leaders that are making a difference as we move through the 21st century. And a country that we have started to focus on in a major way is the country of India. Uh, it's being projected they're going to go beyond 1.4 billion people in this country and it may very well join the league of the top five economies uh, in the world. And so this is something that we need to pay attention to, but yet a majority of the population are still tied to the land. So how do we bring about economic development in ways that actually increases the lifestyle, at the same time decreases the impact on the environment? And in, uh, India is a signer for the COP21, the uh, Paris Protocols for Climate Change uh, Abatement, at the same time to increase sustainable development. And I have sitting right beside me a friend of ours that comes on a fairly regular basis now. This is uh, Sadir uh, Sukwa, who is Outreach Coordinator and Specialist for Biodiversity for Livable Climate, the DC chapter here. And joining us uh, by Skype all the way from India is uh, Kiran Vasa, who is a uh, Vice Sathi a full-time aid worker in India with the Association for India's Development, AID. And Kiran, welcome to the Emerald Planet TV. Hello, thank you for having me on. Uh, we're glad to have you here. And I uh, understand that uh, you're a very hard worker and you really are out in uh, the areas uh, where it really is important for people to learn about organic farming specifically. So tell us a little bit about your work as a full-time aid worker actually in the communities that we're talking about. Uh, like you were saying, uh, agriculture is really crucial uh, part of uh, India's livelihoods. Uh, about 55% of uh, people in India depend on agriculture still. And uh, it is our, uh, uh, you know, it's our vision that basically uh, the that India can show a different trajectory in agriculture in terms of making agriculture both ecologically sustainable and economically sustainable for a majority of the people. Because if we take the Western uh, countries, the trajectory that they've taken, it's only about one or two percent of the people uh, left doing agriculture and all the other people have come off the land. And uh, we would like India to pursue a different path and that's basically our uh, vision. And uh, we've been working in terms of uh, helping farmers uh, who are in distress, like what Revti has done with the flood and cyclone affected farmers and also some farmers who are uh, really in distress. But also, uh, in terms of making agriculture sustainable, uh, both in terms of moving to the organic agriculture practices, uh, but also forming cooperatives and uh, uh, you know being able to market their produce better and so on. Because ultimately, uh, for a small farmer uh, who owns less than five acres of land uh, in India, typical farmer in India owns less than five acres of land, how can uh, they, uh, together with livestock and together with what they produce on the land, uh, make it economically viable, that is also part of the challenge. Uh, otherwise, uh, you know, we will have millions of people leaving the land and following the same kind of unsustainable development paradigm. Yeah, the whole thing about this, uh, Kiran, is as we're looking at the faces of the people here that you actually work with, is how to allow them to stay in their own uh, villages and their own communities, but at the same time to increase their livelihoods so they feel like that they are actually taking part in what's going on around the globe because no matter how isolated you are you still have a chance through cell phones now 
uh, through uh, satellite connections for computers, television, to know what's really happening. So what is the message that you're trying to get across to people living in these local communities to say if you stay here you can actually have a better life and then moving into the teeming cities which as you know are all over India. Uh, that's right. Uh, so I think that that is where um, agriculture as well as various occupations which are dependent on agriculture because it's not only cultivating the crops but all the other occupations which are related to that which are really sustaining the rural uh, parts of India. Uh, and uh, what we have shown is uh, through various examples of uh, uh, you know farmers successfully practicing uh, sustainable agriculture as well as forming cooperatives and making uh, agriculture more viable, we've shown that it is possible. Uh, but uh, it doesn't mean that every farmer uh, is able to do it by himself or herself. For example, uh, you know, the, the, the family that you were just seeing, uh, this lady's name is Kanakamma, uh, her husband committed suicide. Uh, there are whole millions of farmers who are committing uh, suicide uh, you know, over the last uh, 20 years, uh, basically because the agriculture is not viable. Uh, so he had gone into cultivation of commercial cotton and uh, got into a very deep debt uh, and committed suicide. But this lady uh, who has two daughters, one of them is uh, physically challenged. Uh, but uh, because of some uh, basic assistance that uh, we have been able to mobilize, uh, like about 10,000 rupees, you know, which is less than $200, uh, she is now actually on her feet uh, she has gotten into vegetable cultivation rather than cultivating commercial cotton uh, and also in a sustainable way. Uh, now they are harvesting tomatoes, they are harvesting okra and many other vegetables and being able to make a basic living, you know, so that the children can go to school and so on. And there are, uh, you know, thousands of stories uh, like this where farmers are getting back on their feet, even those in distress. Uh, Kieran, uh, let's look at, Kieran, let's look at that, this uh, photograph. You know, Kieran, Kieran. Uh, let's look at this photograph here. How does this really impact the lives? This is something that people uh, are mystified that they have these small plots. Uh, they are converting over to organic farming. Uh, they're uh, having less impact on the soil, the water, and the air in their local communities. And actually, they're able to increase their livelihood. Tell us a little bit about that dynamic. How is that working? Yeah, uh, so there are two or three things which are happening. Uh, one is basically sustainable use of natural resources. Uh, so, um, uh, you know, through the entire period of green revolution in India, uh, the emphasis was on growing irrigated crops. So even in areas where uh, irrigation is not really possible, uh, only, uh, you know, monocropping of paddy and so on, uh, rice. Uh, was promoted rice and wheat, uh, but what we are uh, doing, you know, with farmers is basically to grow diversity of crops. So on the same plot of land, uh, even if it's a three acre or four acre land, which is a really small plot, um, they grow about, uh, you know, 10 to 20 different crops uh, within that same area. Uh, so there is a natural dynamic by which it becomes uh, sustainable and the mm -hmm. crops grow, even if one crop fails in a particular season, especially in this uh, time of climate change. Uh, climate being unpredictable, even if one or two crops are adversely impacted, the other crops would uh, survive. That's one thing. And also there's a sustainable use of water uh, because every uh, farmer cannot grow irrigated crops. Uh, therefore, when you're uh, focused on rain-fed agriculture, where primarily the water is coming from rain, uh, which is true for 60% of India's uh, agriculture. Uh, so that is where we can really make an impact in terms of increasing the income of the farmers because they're growing driver's crops and also they are growing crops which are more suitable to their climate rather than uh, going off the just monocropping of rice, cotton or uh, wheat. Yeah, looking at that too, and I'm going to turn over the next question to Sadir here in a minute, but uh, looking at these crops and the, uh, the in-cropping, the multi-cropping of the same uh, acre or hectare of land, uh, how is that actually renewing the soil and at the same time lessening the negative impact on the water and the air? Uh, that's very good. In fact, the photograph that you are just showing, uh, it is a plot where uh, before cultivating uh, paddy, before cultivating rice, uh, they've grown uh, about seven different varieties of, uh, they've sown seven different varieties of uh, crops there. And most of this is going to be plowed in to the soil. Uh, so that richly, uh, you know, there's about 1800 uh, tons of 
uh, organic material which goes into the soil uh, in a five acre plot when you do this kind of a, a cultivation. So there is a constant renewal that is happening and uh, the, the crop even after harvesting, either it goes as a feed uh, for the cattle or it goes back into the soil to renew the uh, fertility. And this is what is really uh, keeping the sustainable agriculture, organic agriculture alive. Uh, and the second uh, part of it is basically that when your soil is strong, uh, then uh, your pest attacks and your disease attacks also become much lesser. And they are also manageable without using harmful chemicals. Uh, so we've completely phased out uh, wherever we are working, chemical pesticides and chemical herbicides uh, and weedicides. And also for the soil fertility, we are using organic methods. Uh, uh, Sadir, won't you ask the next question? Uh, hi, Karen. Uh, you also work yeah. with uh, urban consumers. Uh, so what, what do you do working with uh, urban consumers and farmers to get each of them to understand uh, each of their needs and, and work together? Yeah, I think at the first level, uh, there's a growing disconnect, you know, between the urban consumers and, uh, uh, you know, and, and the farmers. And, uh, you know, I've seen this go into a real extreme when I was living in the U.S., uh, where, you know, people mostly in urban areas do not really know where their food is coming from. So we want, uh, uh, you know, the urban consumers in India to retain their link uh, to the farmers. So we've started a uh, Sahaja Aharam, which is a uh, consumer cooperative as well as a farmer cooperative. So both consumers and farmers are part of this uh, uh, cooperative. And uh, through that, we've been able to uh, establish the linkage back uh, with consumers going and visiting villages and seeing how the food is produced. And the second aspect of it, of course, is to bring healthy food to the consumers. Uh, right now, organic uh, produce is a premium product where uh, you, know, you need to really pay a high price and it's available only in a few localities. Uh, but uh, what we are trying to do is make uh, organic produce affordable to the consumers. At the same time, uh, a big share of their produce needs to go to the farmers. Uh, uh, you know, when typically you go into a superstore and buy uh, food, uh, just about 10 to 20 percent of that really goes to the farmer. Uh, uh, even in uh, you know even in um, uh, things like bulk items like rice and so on uh, and if you are buying processed foods uh, then it's a much less percentage that goes to the farmer so what we are trying to do is uh, to make sure that about 50 percent of whatever the consumer pays goes to the farmer and that is the basis on which we are building our uh, consumer and producer cooperatives yeah, looking at that, and we're just about running out of time, and uh, you've been very articulate and uh, very great to share your knowledge and your wisdom. Uh, in about 30 seconds, what do you see for the expansion of your kind of work uh, where people like you working directly in the villages and local communities to enhance organic and other kinds of value-added agriculture? Uh, well, uh, we are also working with the government trying to make this not just as an alternative uh, program, but as a mainstream program. Uh, so now organic agriculture, sustainable agriculture, uh, you know, growing of dry land, millet crops, all these things we've been successfully able to make them part of the government programs uh, so that now they are actually being implemented in... Um, uh, and this you is Peter and Lisa uh, as so we create the Emerald Planet. Art, a universal language, an expression of culture, of self. And now, thanks to Empowered Women International, a way for emerging and established immigrant and refugee artists and artisans to find hope to earn a living while enriching the lives of all of us. Empowered Women International making a better America every day. For more information on Empowered Women International's educational programs or to make a tax-free donation, contact cfrip at aol.com. Easy to 
tell which kids have trouble with their eyesight. But that's not always the case. Even though one in four children may have a vision problem, eye doctors tell us the symptoms aren't always so obvious. We do know that 80% of all childhood learning is visual. And without good vision, kids can have trouble learning to read. And may fall behind in school. For clues on how to spot the real life signs of childhood vision problems, and what parents can do, visit checkyearly.com. A public service message from the Vision Council of America and reading is fundamental. to the Inside Scoop Emerald Planet. Here again, your host, Dr. Sam. Hello and welcome to the Emerald Planet and Emerald Planet TV. I'm Dr. Sam Hancock, the Executive Director, President of the Emerald Planet and also with the Emerald Planet TV coming out of Washington, D.C. on a week-to-week -week basis. We're looking at 144 different nations trying to identify and to share with you, the viewers, both here and abroad, about some of the best of the best, the best practices that are actually making a difference, are bringing change to the lives of millions, actually billions of people around the earth. We're looking at a country called India that actually it looks like it's going to be the largest population on the planet, going by 1.4 billion people. And also many experts, particularly economists, are saying that it could become the number three or definitely in the top five as far as its economy as we move towards 2050. And so how we're going to be able to take care of a nation that makes up such a huge amount of the population of the globe itself. And we're looking at ways that actually people are enhancing the quality of life. And we have Ara Vida, who is uh, Phil Lala Muri, and he is the development coordinator for the Association for India's Development, called AID. And sitting right beside me is our special guest here in the studio, uh, Sadir Sukha, who is the Outreach Specialist for Biodiversity for a Livable Climate, the D.C. chapter. And so these two organizations are working closer together. And I think, uh, Aravinda, are you on the line? Coming in by uh, Skype? Yes, I am. Thank you there very much. There you are. Welcome. Mm -hmm. Glad to have you on Emerald Planet TV. Thank you very much, Sam. Very glad to be here. And uh, I understand there's great things going on with your organization, AID. You're growing at a very rapid rate. But tell us a little bit about what you're doing and what do you see as the long-term influence and the effect on understanding as far as the outreach work that you're doing now and that you plan to be doing into the future? We are working with a number of organizations in India. and. Um, it's hard to, you know, it, how to say the the long term effect is something that is evolving um, all the time. Some, it's not linear. Sometimes we will be working um, on an issue for a long time. Um, for example, millet, um, which you can see uh, there today in the slide you just showed, we have uh, eleven kinds of grains, which um, just a couple of years ago uh, in the cities people hadn't really heard of, uh, but through through our continuous efforts to promote these grains, make links between um, farmers and consumers, we actually have a growing demand for these grains. So it's at some point you have a quantum leap where um, suddenly everybody is talking about millet and, and um, we are trying to work in such a way that this doesn't um, become a fad, it doesn't become an elite health trend, but the farmers and the communities who have been sustaining this crop over generations remain at the center. Yes, when um, I was uh, actually traveling growth. and living in uh, Korea, when I was there, there was a uh, demand by the central government that every other day that you could only have half rice and half millet. And, oh, really? uh, and it was absolutely fantastic because I looked for those days, the Koreans, didn't, most of them didn't like it at all. I loved <laughs> it. 
And I kept thinking, why, why don't we go back to that? And uh, so uh, tell us a little bit about millet as a grain. Why is it so important? And why is it actually much more nutritious uh, than rice itself? Sure. Um, millet is, is a, a category of grains. Um, there are several types of uh, plants, if you, you know, look at the species, that all come under millet. So um, every region will have its, uh, its variety of millet that grows well in that region. In fact, many varieties of millet um, grow uh, un, uncultivated, they, they grow wild. And um, a, as you may know, any plant that grows wild uh, does so because it has uh, an extraordinary ability to draw nutrients from the soil and um, its own immune system to fight pests is also quite strong. So that means without any assistance from uh, a farmer, this plant is able to draw its nutrients and fight off its pests. And that is a, that means that the, that plant um, you know, can give us uh, greater nutrients and us uh, more uh, things to boost our immune system. So this is why millet is so important for us as a, from the nutritional point of view. Now, for the, it's also an earth-friendly and farmer-friendly grain because I said, as I said, it, it requires um, few inputs. I mean, there are some that are some varieties that are growing wild, other varieties that are growing with. Um, you know, they're, they're drought resistant, so they don't need to be irrigated. They don't need um, fertilizer and pesticide. In fact, they do better without those things because of, uh, you know, various reasons if we have to get into the, uh, you know, more finer points of agriculture. So this is a, this is a crop that is, um, it's good for farmers' livelihood. It doesn't cost that much to grow and therefore it's accessible to the poor. And it's also, uh, it, it, it also gives back to the earth, believe it or not. This is a crop, um, you know, after uh, we harvest it and we take what we want for human consumption there there's the the rest of the plant which is good for fodder which is good for the animals there are other parts of the plant that are good um to put back into the into the earth for biomass so it's a it's a plant that really supports holistic uh agriculture and holistic health well i'm going to leave this image up for uh just a minute or two sagir uh arvinda hi uh so hi sagir so if uh if millet is so Nutritious for, nutritious for people and beneficial to farmers and, and the earth. Mm -hmm. uh, why aren't uh, farmers growing it more? Why aren't people consuming it more? Uh, why do you need to uh, make an effort to promote it? Well, I have this very same question. Um, you know, I could answer this from a variety of angles. I mean, one. I mean, if we just start from the from consumer habits, um, you can say why are we? You know, why do we have to reintroduce millet? But if you take a closer look, there are many communities in India who never stopped eating millet. These are the people who are living in more remote areas and rural areas. They have not lost their um, traditional uh, diversity in their food habits. They uh, have act. They, they live near wild areas. They live near forest areas, so they have access to those uncultivated foods, and they do, they also eat them regularly. They haven't forgotten how to eat them. I mean, many of us, if you brought us a bag of millet all ready to process, you know, would we know what to do with it? So how come we have lost all of these things? It's part. It's partly due to the rise of industrial agriculture. Um, which favors uh, you know, profit over health, and therefore favors uh, growing a mono, you know, growing one grain instead of ten in a given field. Michael Pollan has written about uh, how the U.S. Um, grain basket has, has been dominated by corn um, and and a few other grains. In India, we see the same thing with rice and wheat. Um, but if you go closer to the forest, you find that there are, um, you know, not only a, many varieties of grains, but, you know, nuts, seeds, fruits, vegetables, roots, shoots, all of these things. Last year there was a forest food festival where they invited forest-dwelling communities to bring every variety of uh, food that grew in their village. Each, each community brought the foods from their surroundings, from their village and forest area. And you wouldn't believe how many varieties of foods they counted at the end 1500 unique varieties of food if you add everything up uh, as i said fruits vegetables grains nuts roots shoots leafy greens all of these things and um of those 1500 varieties 900 were uncultivated that means without 
you know, agriculture without farming and irrigation and, and all of these inputs, these foods were growing. If we want to ask why millet has disappeared, we have to go all the way back to asking why the forests have disappeared, why we don't have an environment and a culture and a lifestyle that allows this diversity of grain to flourish. So reintroducing millet into our diet, reintroducing millet into the farm ha is to do more with just a food, but with a whole eco, a whole approach to agriculture, a whole approach to ecology and culture. Uh, Aravindi, when when you approach people, say the consumers in the urban mm -hmm. areas, and talk about millet and how yeah. to incorporate that into their diet, mm -hmm. what would be their response? And then when you're talking to the farmers, yeah. actually producing this in the local communities, mm -hmm. what is their response? And how do you bring these two together? Because you're talking about, in a sense, almost a miracle food that's growing on its own. It needs very little inputs. It's actually improving uh, the environment. And at the same time, it's allowing people to have a diversity of their diets while actually reducing their cost for food, which is huge in many of these communities where they're living on uh, maybe one dollar a day or equivalent yeah. to two dollars a day maximum so uh, this is uh, really uh, almost in a sense God given to these people so how do you bring that match and what is the perspective of each of these diverse communities the consumer and the farmer Sure. Yeah, we've talked to um, we've we talked to people in different settings, and we've gotten different kinds of responses in the in the um, small towns and and villages. What we find is that the older generation is right there with everything you just said. They would say to me, they would say, "This is." God-given crop. This is uh, nutritious. It's good for our farms. Everything, right? Um, but that's the older generation. The 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 modern generation finds that to be old-fashioned. Millet <laughs> is um, is not trendy. All of the uh, you know, it's now. It's you just have to tell to them. You trendy. just have to tell them that old is new again, right? Uh, it, well, it is new again. It's very interesting because the the people who who don't live close to the town, the people in the remote rural areas and the forest dwelling communities never forgot millet. They're still growing it. They're still eating it. Nobody is sitting there giving them a pep talk about why they should eat millet. They, they've they never forgotten. They know how to process it. They know hundreds of recipes. It's part of their, it's part of their whole lifestyle. They grow it. They use the leaves to thatch their roofs. They use some of it for the fodder. Their, their festivals are centered around it. All of this, right? And now as you move closer and closer to the, to the urban areas, it's, it's gotten forgotten, but then you have, you know, the revival. We're, we're gonna we're running out of time uh, thank you for all this information but uh, we are going to go out uh, and thank you for being with us and uh, thank you viewers for being with us as we look at this very interesting topic of the expansion of organic agriculture in the country of India so thank you for being with us on the Emerald Planet TV as we look around the globe to create the Emerald Planet.